So we're excited today just to continue our Easter series, um, the counselor or the questioner. And as mentioned before, we're taking a bit of the, the stuff from Life Church, and we've done it before, but it's all new stuff that we're reworking, redoing for today as we celebrate Christ. And, and today's question, and we'll get there, is do you want Jesus? Do you really want Jesus? Because when you want something, when you go to a dinner table, go to a restaurant and you order a meal, it means you want that meal. But when the meal arrives, you have to eat it, right? When we say we want Jesus, do we, are we ready for the implication of what it means to follow Jesus? Are we ready to walk as children of light? Are we ready to reflect the glory and the goodness of Christ in our lives? Are we ready to lay down our own wants and desires for Christ? Uh, amen. And, and that's kind of where, where we get to this morning, and we're going to read it in a bit, but John 5, 2 to 9, about the, 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 the cripples and the, the lame and the deaf around the pool. Did this go off, or did you just put a soft, okay, just put a softer, uh, around the pool, um, and, and, and Jesus is going to ask, do you want to get well? In other words, do you want me to inject myself into your life? Because nothing shows us more about Christ injecting himself into our lives than Easter. Right, Christmas, he's born and emptied himself. But Easter, he said, he secured for us the presence and the gift of the Holy Spirit. He secured for us that we would be sons and daughters. He secured for us a personal relationship with the Father. Before that, it was always just, Jesus spoke about my God. After the resurrection, he spoke about our God. He secures for us a personal relationship. Do we want that? Or are we happy to keep Jesus at arm's length? Are we happy to just do what we want to do? So the big question this morning I, I want to ask is, who likes to sulk? Right? You don't have to put your hands up. That's why I made sure Vicky wasn't here. So I, uh, I, I, I'm by far the sulker in our household. I can sulk for days. Um, and, and, but we like pity parties, right? And what's the longest you've ever sulked? I've sulked so long that even the Holy Spirit is like, come on now. Like, let's, let's move on. Like, like, it was just a burnt piece of toast. <laughs> no, I haven't sulked for that. But, but, but even the Holy Spirit is like, come on, just get over it. And we double down, right? Because we like to sulk. We like that control that pity gives us. We even like to find other people that, that have also had burnt toast. So now we're like, have you ever had burnt toast? I've had burnt toast. We should, no one should ever have burnt toast, right? Um, and, and we surround ourselves with people that agree with us. We, find, we are, surround ourselves with people that, that almost feed into our insecurities, our vulnerabilities, whatever it is, and we find comfort in that in a strange, twisted way. And, and, and so we kind of get to the point where, well, this is just how I am. I'm just someone now that eats burnt toast. Just my life. It's my cross to bear. It's my thorn in my flesh. Why should I change? Why should anyone else change? This is just life. Life sucks and it is what it is. You've ever said that? Maybe this week, life sucks and it is what it is, right? And, and we're kind of like, well, Jesus is real, but life still sucks sometimes. And, and this morning, uh, the, the challenge is going to be, as, we, as Jesus asks that question, do you actually want Jesus in your life? Do you actually want Jesus to call the shots of how you spend your money, how you speak to your wife, how you raise your kids, how you conduct yourself in business? Do we really want Jesus, not as a form of salvation, but we see, and not to be saved, but because we are saved? Because that's what Christ is asking the cripple. Do you really want something different? But the cripple will see in the story, list every reason why he can't change. He becomes comfortable. He finds his identity in what he can't do and not in what Christ has done. What is your identity this morning in who Christ is, what he achieved on the cross on, on, on Good Friday and, and Resurrection Sunday? Or is it what you struggle with and, and how your life is at the moment? Do you want to get well? Do you really want to change? I, I speak to people all the time, and, and I'll just use Smokey as an example. They say, do you want to, uh, uh, they say, I want to stop smoking. It's bad for me. And the first question I ask, it doesn't matter if you come to me and ask me, I want to stop. The first question I always ask is, do you want to stop? Right? Because a lot of people want to stop doing things, right? You, do, I need to stop eating so much. Well, do you want to? Not really. Food is nice, right? Um, do I, should I stop having second desserts? Well, I should, but am I? No, I don't want to. And if you've ever met a smoker, ask them, do you want to stop smoking? And honestly, if they're honest, I'll say, not really, I like it, right? And I'm just using smoking as an example. It can be unchecked sin, it can be things in our lives, destructive patterns in our lives. Until there is a desire for change, change never happens, 
We know that, right? Come New Year, we're all going to have resolutions to be in the gym, but change doesn't happen until you show up. I've seen, I've seen that, that someone said that they, they signed up to gym two months ago, and they've seen no change in their lives, no change in their body, so tomorrow they're going to go to the gym and find out what's happening. Um, but that's exactly us with Jesus, right? We, 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 we know He's there, we want Him there, but do we truly want Him? Do we truly want the implications of a real living Savior in our lives? And I think if we're honest, the longer and longer we're Christian, the longer and longer we can live without Jesus, that we're still saved. So it's not a salvation issue, but it's a joy issue. It's an intimacy issue. It's an overflow of the goodness of God in our lives issue. Right? And and, and we we don't want to change. Because the other thing, right? Sin feels good, but it cannot satisfy Right? And, and that's why we'll get to the text eventually this morning. But it's, it's kind of this idea that the next thing in your life will bring relief. It's all the cripples around the pool believed that when the water stirred, the first person in the water would get healing. And, and, and it may not be a swirling pool in your life, but it's a promotion, a different job, a, a different spouse, a different situation, a different country, whatever it is. Right? There's a swirling in the water. And as soon as we get there, it's done. As soon as we get there, life will be better. As soon as I get that new car, as soon as my children listen, as soon as, as soon as, and we're looking for the next thing, and Satan loves it because we're always chasing the wind. That's what Ecclesiastes says. We're chasing the wind, and we're not resting at the feet of Jesus. And, and where are you resting? What are you putting your hope and your comfort and your future in? Because Jesus is saying, well, do you want to be well? He's saying, well, are you coming to me, or are you coming to something I've created? Nothing wrong if you get a new car, nothing wrong. If you move country, get a new job, all those things, nothing wrong with those things. But our issue is sin is pleasurable, but it is never satisfying. The next thing you get in your life will not last satisfactionally wise, if that makes sense. It's why we love sin, or we hate sin, but we, it's why we sin, because we, we, we believe the promise, the next thing. And Jesus is telling us in the story, it's not what happens, it's who you speak to that makes the difference. In this case, Jesus. And we we see a need for Jesus to bring change into our lives, into our actions, into our thinking. And that's, do we really want Jesus calling the shots in our lives? We, we, We like control. We like telling people what to do. We like being boss. We like whatever it is in our lives. But how we treat people, interact people, do we want Jesus to be to place himself as the center and change how we actually function as human beings. Right? And, and, and that's the tension. We want what we can get. Like Judas, right? He wanted the silver. You read that story and you may not agree with G- Judas, but you understand. Right? You got your tax season coming up. You may not be Judas, but you understand. You may not do it, but you understand. You got hardship. You got struggles. You, got, you, you may not agree with it, but you understand. That's our attention, right? We want Jesus to call the shots in every area of our lives, but we still want our own satisfaction. We still want what we want. We get tired, stressed, emotional, and we almost check our faith at the door. Not a salvation issue, right? We know Christ is sufficient and good. We celebrate on Easter. We sing Good Friday. We, we love Jesus, but if He could just chill a bit with His Holy Spirit and guiding and directing my lives, I've got it under control. Right? I'll, I'll sort my life out, and then when it falls apart, I'll call out to Jesus again, and, and, but then I, I've got a Jesus. We don't actually want Jesus, just me, right? If we're, we're honest, and, and that's the tension of the, the text this morning, is do we want Jesus to inject himself in his way and guiding in our lives, or are we quite happy to keep him at arm's distance and try to control our own lives, control our own everything going on? So we get to our text this morning, John 5, um, and and we'll read and unpack as we go. But John 5 verse 2 says this. So now there there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, Bethesda, um, which has five roof colonnades. And and as I've mentioned already, it was believed that when the, the water stirred, these natural springs or whatever, when they swirled, the first person to touch the water would get healed. The first person to get in. So you've got the cripple, the blind, the deaf, all of these things. And, and, And society is exactly like that in the corporate world, in every environment, is that you have to sacrifice relationship and friendship to get ahead. Right? Church is complete, or Christ is completely counterculture to we sacrifice so we can build together, where society says, well, sacrifice others and build alone. Right? That's why we all have walls. Anyone not have walls with their neighbors? My neighbors are, yeah, so I'll be good. Um, 
But, but why? Because instinctively we build for ourselves. We put up walls. We put up boundaries. And that's exactly what we see. They were willing to sacrifice those around them to get the next best thing. We see it in business. We see it in our own lives. We want everyone else to sacrifice so we can get ahead. And Christ shows us on Easter that he sacrificed so that we could be set free. Time and time again, it comes back to not putting ourselves first, but Christ first. And that's why I ask the question, do we really want Jesus? Because time and time again, Jesus will tell you to humble yourself and serve. Not stand up and, 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 and be accounted for. Right? And, and, and so to break relationships, and, the, and, the, and, and we think, uh, I've already challenged us, the relief comes in the next thing we get, right? If I get to the water, I'm going to be healed. And, and so there's lots of faith bubbling around, but it's this faith tensioned by hatred instead of a faith tensioned by love and sacrifice. Because you want to be ahead of everyone else. So Jesus shows up in the middle of all of this and he asks the question, shows us who he is. So in, in verse 3, in these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there, had been an invalid for 38 years. And the other thing, Jesus knows exactly where you are, what you have endured. Even if you've never verbalized it to people around you, Jesus knows. And, and, and he is moving and he is working in your life. One man had been there, an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him laying there and knew that he had already been there for a long time. And, and this morning as I was going over, this is the only time I can think of where Jesus approaches someone else for healing. Right? Every other time, we've got last week, we were son of David, have mercy on me. We've got people grabbing his hand. We've got people ripping the roof off, trying to get to Jesus. Now we have a, almost a stubborn guy that wants nothing to do with Jesus, and Jesus notices him. And for someone that has a hard heart, for someone that is stubborn, it's really comforting to me to know that God sees me in my foolishness. Amen? Like, like I did not call out to Jesus to be saved. He saw a stubborn, hard heart individual whenever I got saved as a teenager, whatever it is, and he says, I'm going to pull out, pull out my grace and mercy. That's what the cross represents. Not, someone, not those of us who have cried out and been saved, those that didn't even look at Jesus and were saved. That He rescued us, He redeemed us, and He loved us this morning. And, and, and He's pouring out His favor and His goodness in ways we cannot even think or imagine, in ways that we don't even ask. That's where we're going to get to. The God didn't ask for healing. He didn't ask for anything. He didn't even answer Jesus' question, really. Jesus says, you want to be well? He says, oh, I can't be well. I have too much issues in my life. I have, I have too much sin, too much anxiety, too many other people ahead of me. Jesus ignores His excuses and shows the power of the cross. The power of grace and mercy. And he said to them, do you want to be healed? Right? That's, do you want Jesus to inject himself in your life? That's what we're asking. Right? Whether in healing or breakthrough or relationship, in whatever area, do you really want Jesus? Because every person that was healed had to radically alter their lives. They could no longer sit by the gate. They could no longer do whatever it was they were doing. They had to get up and, and reveal the glory and the goodness of God. Even when Jesus said, don't do that, there was so overwhelming the impact of Christ in their lives that how could they not? And the sick man answered him, and, and that's why, what is your list of excuses this morning? Right? Who do you want to blame this morning for why Jesus can't move in your life? Bad boss, bad environment, bad upbringing, bad whatever it is. And he says, sir, so he's respectful, sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. In other words, it's not my problem I'm here, it's everyone else's. The church hasn't called me, society has forgotten about me, no one knows my name, no one cares. And while I'm going, another steps down before me, what can I do? I'm too weak, I have nothing to offer, what do I have, Jesus? What do I have, and maybe that's why I spoke about sulking, right? What do I have? What do I have other than my moaning? Some of us has made moaning our God instead of Jesus. And verse 8 says, Jesus said to him, get up, take your bed and walk. And then at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and he walked. And, and it's, it's, Jesus ignores his problems. Whatever, not, or not his problems, but ignores his excuses. And it's this beautiful outpouring of grace. And that's why even this morning it's just Christ on the cross sees you and me. Christ on the cross pours out his favor on you and me because of who he is, not who we are. And there's two things that happen with recurring problems and three things um, that Craig, I think it's Craig Gershaw points out, three things in this text that we see Jesus doing even when he's not asked. So just quickly, number one, the longer a problem persists, the more discouraged you become. 
Right? The longer a problem persists, the longer life is how it is, the longer financial struggles or relational issues or health issues, whatever it is, we just become discouraged and kind of, well, this is my life. Right? You ever said that? That's just who they are. Right? They will never change. It's just who they are. Or maybe you've said it about yourself. Well, I'm not going to change. This is just how I am. People must deal with it. We don't see that in the Bible. Just FYI. Right, it's a sacrifice and a lay down. That's what I want. Do you really want Jesus? Do we really want Jesus to radically alter our thinking, our behavior, and our patterns? Because yes, I want to get to heaven. Yes, I want to be close to Jesus. But I'm not sure I want him to direct my life. And it becomes a faith issue, a trust issue. Do I believe God can direct my life better than me? Do I think God can control my finances and my, my um, spending better than I can? Maybe he's going to tell me not to buy so many chocolates. Right? It's simple, but it's true, right? Because it's not, well, if I control my budget, if I control my giving and everything else, then I don't have to worry about the conviction of the Holy Spirit in any area of my life. Do you want Jesus in your life? Do you want Him to change and direct your life? Do you, are you willing to take responsibility? Are we just going to sit here this morning and lay down excuse after excuse why we cannot be changed, why God cannot use us? Right? The longer you allow something, do something, the more we start to think that's who we are. The more identity is shaped by our sin, by our circumstances, by our upbringing, and not by who Christ is and what He has done. As we sit here this morning, we are a holy people, a chosen, a chosen generation, known by name because God knows us and He died for us and He, and he formed us. That's our identity. Not your bank balance, your work profile, and that's what makes the gospel so powerful in a generation or a country that has low um, um, employment rates, in, in, a, in a country that's battling economically because our identity is first and foremost in Christ. And when we know who Christ is, then He gives us a fresh perspective on what we endure and what He is doing in and around and through us. But the longer a problem persists, the more discouraged, Right? Maybe in your marriage, you've gone for one or two council sessions, you've gone for a dinner, but nothing actually changes, so you just kind of, well, my marriage sucks, I tried once, um, that's enough, right? You prayed about something once, you tried something, you changed doctor, whatever it is, and that's kind of all it is, what it is, I'm just giving up. And we give up because we think this is all it is to us. Maybe this is what God has for me, maybe this is the, my cross to bear or my thorn in my flesh. And it's discouraging, and most of our days then are spent focusing on everything that is wrong, everything we've lost, everything that could have been, rather than on what Christ has done. And, and when we live our lives in a fantasy of what would have been if I'd married someone else, if I had said something else, if I invested differently, if I didn't trust this person, if I didn't go here, if I didn't move, right? We spend so much time anchored in the past, we cannot see Christ lifting us in the future guiding and directing us, meeting us where we are because we're surrounded by the pool, by every lame and, and, and broken decision and consequence in our lives, we forget Christ is speaking to us in the midst of it. And we say, well, why did God let me get you? Well, we made our own choices to guide and direct, but God has been faithful and God is still speaking to you this morning by the pool, asking you the question, do you want me to inject myself into your life? Paul shares about his thorn in his side. He says, three times I asked God to remove this, and he said, my grace is sufficient. And, and think about it. Paul doesn't unpack what that is. We can speculate and read commentaries and, and whatever else, but he doesn't even harp out on it. He's just kind of saying, I asked God three times, and God just said, I'm enough. Right? He doesn't camp out on it. He doesn't focus on it. He kind of just says, the point of that whole text, I'm enough. I'm enough. The whole point of Easter is Jesus saying, I'm enough. Do we want him to inject us of? Jesus says to come to him all who are weary and heavy laden and he will give us rest. And, and ultimately we do that by fixing our eyes upon Jesus, upon all he has done, the empty cross, his power, his magnitude. Paul says in Philippians 4, he says it like this, 4 verse 8. And now dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise and his name is Jesus. And when we camp out by the pool, when we camp out by the failures of our past, by decisions, by whatever it is that lays before us, the Bible says take captive your thoughts, not by stopping thinking, but by directing it towards Jesus. Right? And that's why when, when, when I, I said, I don't know what Easter feels like today, but it's a choice to survey the wonders of the cross. 
the empty cross, the grace of God, the power of God, the life of Jesus that would love someone like me, that when I was not looking at Him, when I was in the pool, when I was surrounded by circumstances in my own life, Christ still approached and spoke to me. It's a beautiful picture, and that elicits in me praise. Right, the, the Bible tells us to, to not be anxious, but in prayer and supplication. In other words, if my kids still like to kick the ball in the house, and if I say stop, they don't stop. But if I say go play outside, they go play outside. Is telling my children to go play outside punishment? No, it's directive. When the Bible says do not be anxious, it's not trying to lay on guilt that we're anxious. It's saying I have something so much greater for you. Go outside and enjoy the, 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 the sun. Enjoy the presence of the Father, whatever it is. When it says fix your eyes on things of God, there's so much greater things for us. You will not overcome your bad thinking, your, your rabbit holes of, of um, depression, anxiety, of hardship and struggles by just stopping it. Otherwise we would have. But what the Bible shows us is tools and steps is to, okay, let me write a gratitude journal. Let me be thankful today for one or two things and recondition my thinking and my patterns towards worship. Because the only alternative to sulking is worship and praise. To look beyond where we are today towards training our thoughts and our minds to be grateful for Jesus and all He has done that He's with us in the midst of circumstances. And the second thing, when a problem persists, we tend to make more excuses for it. We tend to blame more and more people and never take responsibility for our own actions. Right? You notice that when things get hard, it's everyone else's fault. It's our, it's our country, it's our, our spouse, it's our work, it's everything else but us. It's always someone else, never us, and never our choices. And there cannot be true healing and restoration until we have true repentance and acceptance of responsibility. Yes, there's been sins committed against you, but we still control how we respond and what we do in those circumstances. We are still carry a large burden of responsibility is upon our shoulders. And until we take responsibility, we're going to struggle to find freedom in that. We can make excuses all we want for where we are today, but have we repented and sought Jesus and invited Him in for where we are this morning? And very often in, in, in the midst of our greatest problems, we cannot see beyond the walls. We cannot see God. And this morning is just a reminder to look to the empty cross, to look to the feet of Jesus where you are welcome and invited. You will never change when you're tolerating an issue. When it's just the way it is or the thorn in my side, whatever it is, you're never going to change. The man was 38 years old or had been crippled for 38 years old. We can understand why he was the way he was, why he was defeated. Right? Everyone in life had literally been ahead of him. Everyone else had made it when he couldn't. Everyone else had what he wished he had. You ever been there, right? You look at your neighbors, you look at those around you, even in church, and you're just like, Lord, they have so much more than I have. We can understand that, but until we take responsibility, until we repent, we will not know the peace of God despite not having the, the, the physical. Because again, we want the physical, we don't want the spiritual, and Jesus is offering the spiritual this morning. Do we really want to get well? To start making the right decisions and injecting life and the gospel and Jesus and community into our lives. That in Christ, it is not done. In Christ, there is still, there is still hope and joy to be found. Romans 8.37 says, No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And again, it goes back to the cross. It is Christ that loved us. When we did not look to Him, He saw us and He approached us and He spoke to us. And just three things then, these are very quick points. Three things that Jesus did for this guy. Three supernatural things that, that Jesus injects and should motivate us to, to fix our eyes upon Jesus, to surrender our lives afresh today and say, God, guide and direct me for your glory. The first one, number one, is the cripple didn't even ask to be healed. I've spoken about it. He didn't ask. And, and why do we spend time with Jesus? Why do we spend time in the Word? And not to trick or manipulate, but when we are walking with the good Father, when we are walking with Jesus, He will do things in our lives we didn't even think or even ask for. He's going to pour out His favor. He's going to pour out His blessing. It's what I spoke about last week with, with sharing the biscuits with my children. There's so much in life that we have not experienced and enjoyed because we have swayed from the one that our heart loves. So why do we spend time in the Word? Why do we have disciplines? Why do we have practices so that God would move in our lives in ways that we don't even know how to ask for? This guy was so defeated, so downcast, so um, out of it, that even when he spoke to Jesus, he didn't even know what to ask for. 
But Jesus knew exactly what he wanted and poured out favor. When we walk with Jesus, he will bring conviction into our thinking, into our attitude, into how we function in our community because of the presence and the power and the love of Jesus in our lives, the work of the Holy Spirit, the freedom of the the free-flowing waters of, of Jesus through us. Spend time with Jesus. Prioritize time with Jesus. Don't, and don't make up some super fancy list that you're going to spend 40 hours a day praying and, and never sleep and reading the Bible, but fall in love with Jesus. Fall in love with what Jesus has done for you. Fall in love that Jesus knows your name as his, and, and is speaking to you and is inviting you in to know him, to walk with him through community, through his word. He'll change the way we think and operate without us even having to ask because that's how good God is. Number two, the the God did nothing to deserve it. It's It's the most beautiful picture of grace we find in Scripture. Jesus did not heal the man for any reason other than Jesus was good. Jesus did not save you for any other reason other than Jesus is good. I mean, and, we, and we sit here and go, well, I'm not as bad as everyone Bradley has expla- described this morning. I'm not as bra- bad as Brad was, um, whatever it is, right? And the only reason you're sitting here is by the grace of God and the goodness of God. Nothing you have done. That's the beautiful picture why Jesus is good. Jesus is real. He is sufficient and mighty and powerful to save. So that again elicits in us, well, Jesus is so good. He loves me for who I am. He, he, he loves us enough not to leave us, but, but I can come with my sin, with my doubt, with my brokenness, with my frustration, with my, my angst, and Jesus can handle me. Maybe everyone around you can't handle you. Right? We've got, he's sitting, I saw we've got some teenagers in the house, right? I can't handle that. Jesus, it's Jesus' problem now, right? <laughs> you heard that one. But Jesus will deal with us because He can. We're not designed to handle one another's burdens. We're designed to hold each other up to the feet of Jesus. Time and time again, come to Jesus. He, um, he's done nothing. The third thing, um, the healing did not happen in the way he thought it would. Right? If you read Scripture, Jesus heals um, when people ask. So this guy didn't ask. He didn't do anything. And if you had asked the guy, can Jesus heal you? I guarantee you. I can't guarantee you. It's not in Scripture. But I guarantee you, he would have said, yes, Jesus can put me in the water. Right? If, if, what can Jesus do for you? Right? What can Jesus do to bring miraculous healing into your life right now? And you will say, Jesus can get me a job. Jesus can um, heal my health. Jesus can fix my finances. Jesus can change my heart. Right? Jesus brings miraculous solutions in his own terms and ways that we can't even think or imagine. But the problem is we're bringing Jesus our solutions instead of bringing him our hearts. We want Jesus to act in how we want Him to act. And God is gracious. He hears our prayers. And sometimes He says, no, well, that's not it. And if you you want to deal with things in your life, it's going to take a significant step of faith to just say, Lord, I trust you are good. I trust the cross is sufficient. I trust that your full life and death and resurrection has been accounted as mine, that you are worthy of it all. Our problems are bigger than we can handle, but they're not bigger than God. Do you want God in your life? Do you want God to guide and direct, to to meet you where you're at? What he did for um, the man by the water, what he did for last week, son of David, he can do for us. And what he did for them was reveal who he is. Uh, Let us not, uh, uh, we fully believe in the supernatural, we fully believe in all the miraculous signs and wonders of the the Bible are evident and practiced today. We fully believe that. But the purpose of every miracle, the purpose of every encounter was to show who Jesus was. Do you want to know who Jesus is? Not just in a salvation, but in to live out as salt and light, as sons and daughters of the Most High God. Do you want His forgiveness? Do you want His grace? Do you want to be spiritually well? Do you want to belong to Him? Do you want the promise of eternity? Do you want Him to guide and direct you? Romans 10, 13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Are you ready to call out to the name of the Lord this morning? Not just in salvation, but in surrender afresh for your household, for your life, for every aspect, uh, uh, you know, not on behalf of someone else, but, but for your, your, your life, for those in your community. Lord, Guide and direct. Inject yourself that we would know you. Lead and direct according to your plans and purposes and not mine. So as the band comes up, I'm just going to pray. And then 
Yeah, our ministry team isn't here this morning, but if you need prayer for anything, I'll be up front. Um, so if you just want to come spend some time with Jesus, either in your seat where you are, or if you want someone to pray for you, you can come forward to the front and we'll pray for you. Um, but as we sing our last song, and it's thank you for the blood, it's just that we would just sit and go, Lord, thank you. Thank you that you approached me even when I wasn't looking for you. Thank you that you pour out your blessing because you walk with me even when I don't ask for it. And thank you, Lord, that your ways are far beyond my ways, that your ways to work and direct, that I don't have to bring you solution, I just need to bring you my heart, and I can trust that you are sufficient. So let's just pray. Yes, Lord, we just... This Easter Friday, we want to say thank you, Lord. This good Friday is good because you are in control. That you laid down your life and you picked it up again. No one took it from you, Lord. You willfully laid it down. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whoever believed in him would not perish, would not pass away, but have eternal life. For God so loved Bradley, God so loved every single person in this room. That Jesus laid down his life. And Lord, we want to invite you into our lives, Lord. Our then a salvation plea that we would know you personally. Lord, we want to be the man at the well that feels like we've just been trying to do it for 38 years on our own, trying to get ahead, trying to the next thing. The next thing is going to bring relief, but it hasn't. And we've achieved and we've done and we work, but we are tired and weary. And your word says, come and find rest. So if that's you this morning, you would just lay it down at the feet of Jesus once again and say, Lord, move in my life. Show me your hand. Show me your goodness. Let me hear your voice. And maybe the, the, this morning you, 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 you've, you've pleaded with Jesus to be your God. But you've been a Christian for so long, you've learned how to do it without Him. You've learned to navigate the storms and the seasons by saying the right words, but your hearts have wandered. That this morning wouldn't just be another Easter Friday, it wouldn't just be another church service. It would be the day you once again surrender your life and invite Jesus to be your compass, to be your anchor, to be your guide in every area of your life. That Lord, we know this weight of the world is crushing. But you say in your word, fear not, I have overcome this world. Victory is yours. Salvation is yours. Death has lost its sting in you, Jesus. So we just surrender afresh, Lord. Guide and direct, we pray. But we lay down our own desires at the feet of Jesus, Lord. We know so many of our prayers of this congregation, Lord, that we intercede and we pray for time and time again, Lord. We bring you solution upon solution. And this morning, Lord, we just stop. And say, Lord, you move and direct in our lives as according to your plans and purposes. That we would hear that still small voice. We would hear, feel that comforting arm of a father. We would be guided and directed by you. So, Lord, we surrender afresh this morning. You are wonderful. You are mighty. You are good. We trust in you. We are thankful, Lord, for the full death, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. We are thank you that your word says you know our name. May God speak to you this morning, church. May God and direct you for his glory. Have your way, we pray. Lord, thank you for the blood, Jesus. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for all you have done for us. Thank you, Jesus, in your wonderful name. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you.